Welcome to Books and Bridges, everyone. Thank you for joining us. We are a public humanities institute of ideas and conversation, shaped by the belief that community forms around beautiful dreams, profound reflections, and searching discourse. Tonight, we explore the intersection of soul and literature, how and why we seek meaning from the best books. I'm your host, Nathan Nielsen, and our guest is Terrell Givens. Terrell was born in upstate New York, raised in the American Southwest, and did graduate work in intellectual history at Cornell and comparative literature PhD program at the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill, working with Greek, German, Spanish, Portuguese, and English languages and literatures. As professor of literature and religion at the University of Richmond, he taught courses in Romanticism, 19th century cultural studies, and the Bible and literature. Currently, he is a senior fellow at Brigham Young University's Neil A. Maxwell Institute for Religious Scholarship. He is published in Literary Theory, British and European Romanticism, Mormon Studies, and Intellectual History. The New York Times has praised him for his provocative writing, and Harper's has called him fair-minded, scholarly, and unbiased. So, Terrell, welcome to Books and Bridges again. Thank you, Nathan. Good to be here. Very great to have you. So let me just start our conversation with a philosophical question. And let me uh, draw upon the words of uh, the great poet, Robert Frost. He spoke about the, what he called the immortal wound that we receive when we collide with great literature. Once we, once we become infected, a term Tolstoy used, with the feelings and experience of the author, Frost says that we can never get over it. What in your in your conception is this immortal wound that keeps driving human beings to the muse of literature? What are your thoughts? Uh, that's a pretty vivid phrase. I don't know exactly what uh, Frost may have had in mind, but it it uh, sounds very eerily similar to the words of Franz Kafka, right? When he he talked about great literature being a an ice pick to shatter the frozen sea of our minds, wow. and uh, so if uh, if you're asking me to give my own spit on this, uh, rather than second guessing Frost, I would say that in both cases, whether we call it a, a shattered frozen sea or a, or a wound, um, I'd like to think there, there are two things maybe that are going on when, in terms of our encounter with great literature. <clears throat> First of all, I think um, part of that wound may be coming face to face with our own mediocrity. <laughs> And uh, I mean that in the sense that anybody who has had a profound encounter with literature, anybody who can remember uh, the first time they read the story of the Bishop's Candlesticks uh, in, you know, Les Miserables, or the first time that they uh, wept at a, at a, at a denouement in, in Shakespeare, I think what's happening in those moments is that we we pierce through this veil of the commonplace, of the average, the normal, <clears throat> the routine, and we come face to face with a kind of greatness of ideas or of the human soul or the human spirit, and we realize how absent that experience has been in our day-to-day -day lives. And so we want to come back to refresh our encounter, I think, with those, those most sublime uh, episodes in, in human thought and, and literature. So that, I think, is one part of it. Uh, the second part of it, I think, maybe giving it a, a slightly more positive and sensuous um, explanation, is that literature at its best, <clears throat> I think, does something that a, a great linguist once called making the sign palpable. So let me explain how I understand this, because this is really at the heart of my whole, I guess, understanding and philosophy of, of literature and literary experience. You know, if you think about a window and how a window functions in uh, normal life, it's, it's an invisible medium through which we see the world, the world can see us. Uh, so the best window is the window that's most invisible. Uh, we are oblivious to it to the point that we might even bump into it if it's clean enough. And, uh, and yet when we, when we go into a cathedral, all of us 
have had that experience of not a cathedral, any church with stained glass, when we are suddenly arrested by the, the impact of this flurry of light that comes at us. And I think if you think about what's happening, because I've, I've, I've spent time wondering what is it that is so dramatic and unique about that experience of an illuminated stained glass window. And I think it's because we are so accustomed to, to turn our gaze toward a window and see through it. And on this particular occasion, our gaze turns instinctively to the window and suddenly the color is bombarding us and we're hit by the medium that is usually so invisible to us. And suddenly we're reveling in, in the color and the light and the refraction. And I think something exactly analogous to that happens with great literature. Uh, you know, if I scream uh, at, at the top of my lungs, fire, get out, nobody stops and says, that sounded like a, a South Brooklyn accent, right? The words are invisible. You respond to the message. And so 95% of our communication with language is referential. It's, it's pointing your gaze or your mind to an idea, a thought, a reality. And then suddenly we, in, we encounter a poet like Gerard Manley Hopkins, right? And, and we read his, his lines, um, uh, I caught this morning, morning's minion, kingdom of daylight, stoff and dappled on drawn falcon and of his riding level underneath him, steady air. And suddenly we're, we're hearing the musicality of language in a way that we haven't before, just like the stained glass as, as a medium. So I think that is, is, is some of what's happening in our experience of great literature, especially poetry, but I think even even fiction to some extent, is that we are marveling at the musicality, the, the sensuous quality of sound and imagery, uh, combinations, patterns of, of language that we haven't appreciated before. Uh, I think that's an aesthetic experience, but I also think that there's a really important ethical dimension to that as well. Um, you know, Thomas Merton, the great uh, Trappist monk and mystic, was, was asked one time, what do you think is the, is the most grievous spiritual illness of our age? And he responded unexpectedly by saying, efficiency. <laughs> and, you know, you have to stop and think about that. Right? We want faster cell phones and faster internet and, and more efficient computers. And why is that spiritually dangerous? And I... I take him to be saying, because we're, we're in such a hurry to get from A to B, that we're not stopping to ask whether B is a destination worth arriving at. And so we've, we're, we're kind of uh, rendering, we're, we're, we're effacing from the human experience. Uh, slowness, uh, deliberation, distraction, contemplation, and so there, once again, uh, I think it actually was a group of Russian formalist critics in the 1940s who were, who were the first to say this about literature in particular. They said it was, it's, the purpose is to make the stone stony, to slow down the process of perception and allow us to be immersed in the moment. So that was, that was a long answer, but... Uh, I love that, yeah. Do you know the names of those Russian critics? Well, the principal one was Viktor Shklovsky, and you can still find some of his essays. His, his greatest essay was called Art as Technique, and uh, it comes 1920s to 1940s is when most of them wrote. Uh, the Romantics, the, you know, the, the poets that I spent my life teaching and, and writing about, uh, arrived at that idea earlier. They just didn't articulate it, I think, quite as concretely and, and precisely. But if you think about the poet Shelley, right, there's this great moment in the early 1800s, right? The Industrial Revolution is underway. Technology is advancing. Business and commerce are on everyone's minds. And, and uh, Thomas Love Peacock writes this, this criticism of poetry. Effectively, what he says is, who has time for that kind of indulgence anymore? And so Percy Shelley takes upon himself to answer that criticism. And his most memorable phrase, I think, in his response is to say, poetry allows us to pierce the veil 
of familiarity. And what he what he means is that uh, well, it's like the, the 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 great novelist Leo Tolstoy. He once had this delightful meditation in his diary where he he just remarked. He says, "I was cleaning my apartment today, and I went to clean the the divan, the sofa, and I couldn't remember if I had already cleaned it. And at that moment, it occurred to me that most of our lives pass unconsciously." And if we're not aware of that moment, it's as if we didn't live through it. And that's that's what the romantics were saying, right? Everybody remembers your first kiss, but how many of you remember your fourth kiss or your seventh? Um, we we taste honey once for the first time. We go to the seashore once for the first time. And so there's this, this threat of numbness <clears throat> to life that... Uh, begins to encroach upon us almost from our earliest years, where everything becomes repetition, becomes customary, becomes habitual. And so the romantics said it is our task as poets to help you to experience again the innocence of perception, to see the world once again as a child does, uh, because that in and of itself uh, is an ethical task, because it allows us to live our lives in a more fully human uh, and present way, and uh, I, I think I think they were right. Yeah, that's a beautiful answer. Thank you for that. It, it, it makes me think of the double nature of that literary awe that that a great work can produce in us. It both kind of reduces us and enlarges us. It, it both kind of effaces our presence and and kind of throws us or taps us into a stream of some kind of hyper super presence that. Uh, that only that the uh, the mind of the author could produce. It, it's it kind of jer it jerks us in both directions and it produces a kind of jolt. I think. No, I think you're exactly right. I think that's what I meant about kind of the the shock of our own mediocrity. But because we're confronted with another human being who has transcended that, right? We're and we're connected to that possibility, and so uh, so I, I you know one of my favorite poems, modern poems is uh, it's by the poet John Chardy, and it's a, a poem about a, a German man, German Jew, who has survived Auschwitz, and he comes back to life. And the poem briefly chronicles the, the resurrection, figuratively speaking. But the most beautiful part of the poem is the ending, where it says that in the spent of one night, he learned three truths that hell is the denial of the ordinary, that nothing lasts, and that a clean sheet of paper waiting under a pen is a gift beyond all history and hurt and heaven. Uh, there's, there's the sense that, that Shardy captures there, I think, of the infinite possibilities that literature represent for us. And, uh, you know, I, I think there's something tragic in that moment that every student experiences when they, they finally formally declare a major, right? And there's something exciting, rich potential about that, but it also means that suddenly their life has funneled into this narrow stream that more or less their immediate future will, will fall into. And I think, I think literature is compensation for the narrowness of our existence that is generally confined to one pretty limited sphere of, of activity. Uh, literature consoles us in, in that regard. Well, you, most people don't know that you were actually a, a professor of literature for, you know, over 20 years. Most people are probably familiar with your, you know, your prolific um, writing and your, um, your work in intellectual history, religious history, Latter-day Saint history, and, um, you know, doctrinal kind of exposition. But you are, at, at your core, you seem to me like a, a person of literary bent, and you've taught for over 20 years. What what are some of the courses and, and moments in teaching that you cherish the most? Well, I... I retired at the University of Richmond way back in the in the late 80s to teach romanticism, 
And uh, so I taught a, an array of courses over the years, but that was always my favorite. Uh, it was my favorite course because my my first love has always really been intellectual history, hence, hence doing all the coursework in that program at Cornell. And uh, literature for me had a twofold um, kind of way of satisfying my, my intellectual hunger and appetite. And one is that literature, I think, is one of the most powerful and effective vehicles through which to understand the, the, the history of ideas. Um, all ideas, but theological ideas in particular, right? More people are exposed to religious thought through the poetry and literature they've read than through any theological treatises they've, they've read. And uh, Romanticism in particular represented, uh, well, I, I think most intellectual historians would say Romanticism was the birth of the modern. It's that moment when we transition fully into uh, a modern sensibility and a modern consciousness, both in political thought, in, in, in philosophy, in aesthetics, uh, even in the sciences where we kind of leave behind a 18th century preoccupation with chemistry and structures to 19th century interests in powers and, and dynamisms and forces. So I love I love the romantics. And, and here's what I liked the most about romanticism. And this is why romanticism for me was a natural segue into uh, religious studies, right? Romanticism is a period, generally speaking, we're talking about the era from 1775 to 1830, give or take. And of course, this is, uh, this is the eve of the Enlightenment. So the world, the Western world has undergone this massive paradigm shift where uh, there's a sense that, that you know, intellect and, and, and rationality may not be the most accurate way of fully expressing the human self. And so the romantics are looking for a, a fuller and ampler way of expressing the human self. At the same time, uh, the Enlightenment represents the first devastating onslaught uh, against religion, against religious thought. And so part of what's happening in the early 19th century, among all the great thinkers and, and creative artists of the era, is they're all asking a similar question uh, in one way or another, which is, what happens in the aftermath of the death of God or the death of religion? And whether they're, they're, they're believers or atheists, secularists, or devout, they're all recognizing that religion will never again be taken for granted. Belief will never again be taken. It's the birth of the secular age, as, as Charles Taylor calls it. And so the English romantics in particular, the ones that I studied and taught most often, uh, Shelley, Byron, Keats, the question they're asking is, how do we find a life of human meaning independently of our reliance upon God? And uh, I think that that's a profound question, even for a believer to ask, is, is are my values, is my sense of meaning and purpose uh, utterly dependent on a set of creedal statements? Or is there something independent of belief in the divine that can ground a life of, of meaning and value? Uh, so that's a question that you know, I think I'm still asking, and, and many people are. Do you think literature sometimes does the work that institutional religion can't quite do? Yeah, I think it does the work much better than most institutional religion <laughs> historically has done. Mm. Because um, it exists in that realm of absolute infinite possibilities, right? In some, in, in some ways in the sense that I just quoted the Chiardi poem, but also in the sense that, that you know, why, why are we no longer enmeshed in the Baroque? Why aren't, we, why aren't our painters still painting in the Renaissance style? Um, and it's because every age has to find a new and, and, and fresh mode of expression uh, because uh, yesterday's art is stale already. And so there's this, right, there's this kind of impetus behind the history of art, the history of literature, that is always pushing the boundaries, always looking and, and asking for new modes of expression, new questions to ask and be answered. So 
So yeah, literature is naturally suited to the task of asking the hardest questions and asking them in new and fresh ways. Yeah, it's almost like literature has its own kind of purview. It's, it's like a, it's like some kind of force that's kind of situated between these behemoths of, you know, maybe politics, ideology, um, science, um, religion, and it, and it has its kind of own spontaneity that, that seems to kind of find its, its, its way through all those kinds of, of, of domains, but it also has its own kind of kingdom. Um, yeah, that's precisely right. But that recognition, that sense that you're describing, what you're really talking about is the aesthetic as a distinct ontology. The, the aesthetic is a distinct realm. And we take it for granted that, that uh, people have always thought of art in the same way that we moderns do. But, but uh, that actually is not at all the case, right? Until the late 1700s, if you had asked a typical thoughtful individual, what is art? They would have said, well, art is imitation. That's what art does. Art imitates, right? It imitates reality or nature or the truth or some absolute ideal. And it, it isn't until we get to the late 18th century that, that there's this dawning recognition that, um, no, actually, art is constituting something that is its own thing. Um, uh, this was recognized 2,000 years ago by, by Aristotle, but it was never fully developed for, uh, well, really until, until the 18th century. But, he, but here's, here's how Aristotle captured the essence of the problem. If I were walking from Sparta to Athens and I passed uh, the scene of a battle, there would be decaying corpses and the smell of putrefaction and, and right, all kinds of things that are distasteful and disgusting. And after I finished vomiting, I would finish my, my way to my destination. And once I get there, if entering the foyer, I were to see a painting called The Battle of Thermopylae, right? My reaction would be to say, oh, that's beautiful. Who rendered that? Look at, look at the shading. Look at the color. Look at the contrast. And so Aristotle recognized, right, 300 years before Christ, that that we're not judging art, we're not responding to art, we're not experiencing art in the same way that we've experienced the real world. And so it was left to the 18th, 19th centuries to develop a whole kind of science of aesthetics where they begin to, to ferret out what is it that we're responding to? What is it that is the source of satisfaction and pleasure? And how do we cultivate that aspect of, of art, which is its own unique thing, as you said. Well, how has your experience been as a reader of literature, a lifelong reader and, and you know, enjoyer of literature, as opposed to a, a, a critic, a professor of literature who studies it in a more systematic way? How, how has that been, how has that worked in terms of your furthering your kind of your appreciation of literature? Those yeah, two well, you know, that's a good question. Wordsworth uh, wrote a poem in the 19th century in which he said, we murder to dissect, right? So mm -hmm. there's always been this kind of tension uh, in, in uh, between a kind of ignorance is bliss apprehension of the world and a kind of studied clinical analytical approach that seems to strip life of all of its magic and, and mystery, right? Uh, I think that's a myth. I think that's that's I think that's a sentimental myth. Um, and so I would hope, and I believe that my study of, of literature uh, enhanced my ability to recognize what is going on, uh, what complex patterns of meaning, what complex motivations are behind the work, what kinds of resonances does it have with other literature? And I think that's an especially important dimension of, of literature. I was fond of saying to my students, literature isn't ever talking to you as a reader. It's always talking to other texts. So there's this great conversation that's been going on for 2000 years where one text will engage with another. Shakespeare is imbibing and responding to, right? All of the texts that had been written before. And, and what that means is that we have to become fluent in the language of literature. 
And one reason why it's so difficult, I think, for the average person to pick up a Shakespeare or a Mary Oliver and enjoy it as fully as they might is because if you're not conversant with that dialogue that was going on in the preceding generations, it's like listening to just one part of a two-way phone conversation. And so I think the more deeply immersed in the study of literature one is, generally, the more one is likely to, to enjoy and relish the experience. That seems to, in fact, be, be the case as a practical matter, because most people today don't walk into bookstores or go to Amazon.com and order the plays of Shakespeare just to read them for fun, or pick up volumes of poetry just to read them for fun. So... Uh, in, in, in the experience and mind of, of most people today, I think literature is a chore. It's, it's hard, it's a foreign language. Yeah, I think the irony there is that, you know, in, in today's technological age of information overload, we have pretty much all of the, the literary references available to us. And that would, you would think that would only enrich our, you know, appreciation of literature. But do you think that it actually um, impairs literature, this, this information overload, or does it enrich it? Is well, it waning, do you think? Yeah, I don't know. I mean, I, I, think there, I think ideally there's a balance that has to be struck between the cliched and the trivial on the one hand and the ponderous and impenetrable on the other, right? I think uh, I'm an anti-modern, okay, I'm... I'm old school. I, I, I read very little that was written after 1830. <laughs> because in my mind, most modern poetry and fiction is self-indulgent and self-important. Mm. Uh, there are some wonderful, rare exceptions to that. But, but, you know, the information age, it's become cliche to say this, right? But the information age has conditioned us to, to speed read everything, to, to, to see excerpts and, and, and summaries and, and to... to, to to kind of wrench the meaning out of a text as quickly as, as we can. So the art of reading itself is, is what's really imperiled and what is at stake. And uh, I don't know how, how we're going to recuperate that lost art and that lost interest, um, but uh, it's a cause of sadness and concern to me. Uh, I remember once uh, a particularly moving uh, class unfolded as I was teaching what I think is one of the greatest and most troubling texts in Western literature. It's called Manfred. It's a, kind of a Faustian story written by Lord Byron. And I get pretty intense when I'm teaching this because I think it's asking some of the very, very hardest questions of believers in particular. And leaves one almost despairing and unsettled by the end, rather like the, the, the brothers Karamazov uh, can do. And as I finished this grand finale, the bell rings, the students got up to leave. And I remember this one student just sat there frozen in her seat. And she looked around and she said, how can they, how can they just get up and leave as if nothing happened? <laughs> And uh, to me, that was one of, you know, a great, great moment in my teaching experience where she sensed that there was something so important that had unfolded in that text that one couldn't be unchanged. And she said to me then, she looked almost with this, this, this frightened, hopeless spirit, what, what am I supposed to do with this? And I remember all I could say was, you're to be more reflective. And, uh, and, then, she, and then she left. But I, I think that's what great literature will do for us if we let it. It will allow us to be more reflective. But that's not an activity most of us spend much time on today. That is a very modern response to, to ask, you know, what am I supposed to do with this? Or what is the moral, you know? Yeah. What can I take away? What's the takeaway? The deliverable or, or something like that? From it? Yeah, literature doesn't have deliverables necessarily, right? Well, it, it, it can. And I think that that's kind of the problem with the way it's been taught for so long in our public education system, right? Is uh, 
students have been conditioned to think that every text has a secret code, right? Mm -hmm. So you, you read your Shakespeare, you come to class and the teacher says, okay, what was the main point? <laughs> And so we're accustomed to, to boiling it down to its meaning. And of course, the, the truth of the matter is that if we could paraphrase it, then we would just publish the paraphrase and we wouldn't need the original. Um, Literature is a hard, hard thing to teach because uh, it's about immersing ourselves in an experience. It's not about extracting content. And uh, I don't, there's no other discipline, right, in, in the educational system where the whole focus is on immersing ourselves in a particular kind of experience and yet going further, investing more in it than to just say, oh, well, this is what it meant to me and this was my reaction and reducing it to utter subjectivism because it's, it's not about that either. Uh, at least I don't think it should be. I'm, you know, I'm of the, of the old school that believes there is such a thing as great art. And there are great ideas, and they do deserve to be preserved and transmitted uh, and, and become a part of our cultural vocabulary and inheritance. Did you see when you, um, when you taught literature, did you see the, or experience pressure to kind of to, to press literature into the, the service of ideology or politics or some kind of fashionable thought? Absolutely. Absolutely. And, if, and, and, and of course, there are, you know, I actually, my, I, I said I was hired to teach romanticism at the University of Richmond. That's mostly true. I was hired to teach two subjects. I was hired to teach romanticism and I was hired to teach literary theory. So this is the late 80s, early 90s. It's the heyday of this kind of English department mania for post-structuralism, post-modernism, feminisms and deconstructionisms and semiotics and, you know, and, uh, and, and <clears throat> all of those isms exist as an alternative to kind of the, the, the more historically oriented approach to teaching literature, which was formalism. And formalism in simplest language means we don't read it for its content. We don't read it for its ideology. We read it in the same way that we look at a work of art in a museum, to be enriched by the articulation, the beauty. And of course, the isms respond to that by saying, well, that itself is a political position, right? That itself is a kind of conservative entrenchment that affirms the status quo and ignores all of the ideological machinery that's operating in the background and, and so on. Well, yeah, you know, you can make that argument. But the simple fact of the matter is that there is a certain, there's a certain integrity that things possess. And what I mean by that is we can wear a watch because it flaunts our wealth, right? But the purpose of the watch is to keep time. And so there's a kind of respect that we accord to an object if we recognize for what purpose it was created and what purpose it best serves. So we can take any text, we can take a Jane Austen novel and say, oh, look how oppressive the capitalist machinery is in the background that's permitting these aristocrats to be self-indulgent playing their croquet. But it seems to me that to some extent that's a, that's a violation of the integrity of the text, which asks to be read with deference for what it is showing us in, in, in the case of Jane Austen, for example, about, about the clarity and the brilliance that the English language can achieve when it is well handled, right? And so I, I, I feel that literature became increasingly the battleground of competing political ideologies, which position it largely maintains today. And I would point out that when I began teaching literature in 1988, we had over 200 majors in the program. And when I resigned in 2017, we had like 14. I don't think it's a coincidence. I, I think that the profession of, of literature, the practice of English literary criticism effectively destroyed the, uh, the, the, the heart and soul of the discipline and of the, the activity of creative literature. So proving Wordsworth correct, 
get murdered to dissect. <laughs> well, in a way, yeah, I, I guess uh, I, I guess murder isn't too harsh a term for <laughs> what happened to the study of poor innocent. domesticated. Yeah, yeah. And of course, you know the, the the same thing is happening today in an amped up way, right? In a in a in a culture oriented toward the cancellation of anything that is seen to be uh, offensive. Um, I, I, I don't I don't know what the canon so called canon is going to look like twenty years from now. I know that it was very popular in higher education to put stickers on faculty windows that said safe zone. I don't know if that was just Richmond or the East or everywhere, but what it meant was you can come here regardless of your sexual orientation or your gender or your, you know, and, and I always wanted to respond to that by putting on my window a sign that said danger zone. And, and what I meant was, was if you come to my office, come and prepare to be challenged uh, to be confronted with new ideas and new perspectives and alien voices in a way that you you haven't before. And I, I think that's a great shame that one of the most powerful educative functions of literature, which is to immerse us in competing voices, has been kind of sanded down so that now we don't have to confront anything that is threatening or, or uh, unsettling. Yeah, in our age, you know, highly ideological age, we need something to kind of lift us above the fray. And, and literature has historically been one of those things that could lift people on some kind of a common level, lift people above politics, ideology, um, ethnicity, um, economic background. I hope it still retains that force. Well, yeah, I, I, you know, it's it's interesting. You can go all the way back to the pre-Socratic philosophers, uh, Isocrates, one of the first, who was asked, "What what does it mean to be human? What is distinctive about this human species?" He gave the same answer that Descartes would give, that Wordsworth himself would write about, which was to say there is a particular kind of language, not just language in the sense that you know a bee can do a wiggle dance and point to the pollen. But there's a particular kind of power that human language has, which is the essence of our humanity and uniqueness. And what he meant by that was, you know, if your stomach growls and you say, oh, I'm hungry, let's go eat. That's not language in the sense in which Wordsworth means it. That's just a conditioned response. That's just like, you know, the plant turning toward the sun. Your stomach growls, you react to the hunger. But poetry, poetry is not a conditioned response. Poetry operates in the realm of the most pure freedom that the human soul can experience. Because only in poetry, only in fiction, do we image forth a reality that is completely, that can be, that strives to be independent of immediate pressures, immediate political concerns, immediate stimuli or preoccupations, uh, at, its, at its best, that's what literature does. So that, that can sound uh, idealistic and, and, and self-indulgent, but I, I, think, I think that that's the magic and the power and the beauty of literature is that it can elevate us above the immediacy of our concerns and connect us to ideas and truths that are, that are timeless. Yeah, what is going on with fiction? It's this strange thing that we lift above ourselves and it's supposed to kind of reflect reality. It's like a mirror of sorts that we look at. We kind of have to detach it from ourselves, look at it, and it reflects back on ourselves. And so we can see under our nose more clearly. It's an interesting thing. It is an interesting thing. It's a weird thing. And, you know, I taught for 30 years and I never got to the bottom of this weirdness. And here's what I mean about the weirdness, right? Is, um, you can you can watch King Lear, right? We we saw it a few seasons ago at Cedar City. Terrific performance of King Lear. I think Shakespeare's greatest work. You know the ending is coming. You've read it and seen it countless times, and yet when you see the body of Cordelia, you weep. Now, how is it that we can be moved upon to respond emotionally? to a production that we know is fiction and that we know 
the actors are being paid to represent. Um, that question was asked of St. Augustine. It was asked of Samuel Johnson in the 18th century. It's been asked by numerous great philosophers and theorists of literature. What is this power that literature can exert over us? It's like, a, it's like lucid dreaming where we know we're in a dream and yet we still are seized by the terror of the moment. Uh, for me, that, that's, that's tapping into something that I don't, I don't fully understand. But uh, it's, yes. a, it's a mystifying power that I admire and stand in awe of. Yeah, I get the impression that literature is a, is a form of dream work of, of human consciousness that it has its own spontaneity, its own un unpredictability that it can just go places. It's like an empty canvas and it kind of does its own work in, in a way. It, it, and I think that's why the Greeks used the term muse to kind of describe how it works. They had no idea how it works. Yeah. So they used the term muse as a kind of mysterious whispering into the imagination of the writer. And uh, it just, I think it has its own logic. It has its own operation it's a, it's a form of it it's a form of spirituality it's a form of communication that is its own thing i think well it is yeah i, I you know the um you, you haven't asked me if, you know what my favorite work of fiction is i don't know that i i have just one but certainly brothers caramont self would be would be up there for me as it is for many many scholars of literature but let me just say a word about why uh that stands out even among the masters of the European novel. And it connects back to, I think, what you were just saying. Um, Mikhail Bakhtin was a Russian critic, and he was one of the first to try to decipher the magic of Dostoevsky's artistry. And he said he, he, he enjoyed and practiced what he called the dialogic imagination. And let me just explain what he, what he meant by that. If you read a novel by Dickens, right? another great master of realism, you know where the author stands on every moral dilemma presented in the novel, right? Every author's point of view, their moral perspective comes through, whether it's a novel or a poem or, or anything else. But when, when you read Dostoevsky, when you read a book like The Brothers Karamazov, it's like these are real people that have been conjured into existence and they have independent consciousnesses that are speaking through the text. And you can't find Dostoevsky anywhere. It's like somehow he has just channeled all of these independently thinking and acting agents. And uh, there's a plenitude and a richness that pulls you into that universe that you have to contend with. And there's no stable point of reference. You can't say, oh, well, this is supposed to be the moral. This is what the author really wants me to understand or, or where he stands on. So it's it's disorienting and it's uh, it's wonderful. Yeah, I think one could even make the case that Ivan Karamazov, you know, the main one of the main characters, is technically correct, even though in in his um, critique of God, his critique of religion, his critique of suffering, he has a point. He has his own Hell yeah. standing, and so does Alyosha, his brother. And yeah. No one, no one settles the question, but the reader, right? That's right. That's right. Now, Wayne Booth, who is one of the most famous, influential, greatest of American literary scholars and critics, one of the fathers of American New Criticism. Um, he was born and raised a Latter-day Saint. He came to the University of Richmond to give a talk on the power and beauty of literature, just kind of a generic humanities college talk, big audience, big crowd. And at one point in his remarks, he said this, he said, literature has the power to annihilate your faith paradigm and leave you bereft. And then he said, I experienced a crisis of faith reading fiction from which I never recovered to this day. Now, I was asked to host him while he was there, so I got to spend two days with him. And in the aftermath of that talk, I asked him, I said, Professor Booth, by any chance, was it a Dostoevsky novel that you read? And he said, yes, it was. <laughs> I said, was it the Brothers Karamazov? And he said, yes, it was. Oh, wow. So, uh, yeah, that's a powerful work. Yeah. Those Russians, they do it every time. <laughs> yeah. Those dark, gloomy Russians. <laughs>
Do you think a work of literature can be great if it doesn't address the deep spiritual questions of life? If it's just practicality, human emotion, psychology? I, I think it I can think it can achieve a different kind of greatness. Cause you know, I, I think, you know, I've talked about what I think literature can affect at its best. But um, you know, there's a lot of literature that has no greater purpose in life than to just make us laugh or make us smile, right? Yeah. It was brillig of the slithy jove, uh, jive did gyre and gimble in the wave, all mimsy were the rural groves and the mome rats out grave, right? The Jabberwocky by Lewis Carroll. Uh, mm. What is, why do we read a, a poem like the Jabberwocky? I think it's simply to, to relish the playfulness of, of, of sound. And I think that's a perfectly legitimate function that literature can serve. Yeah, you can't impose one purpose or function onto it. That's right. Yeah. So um, let me ask you a question about, more so a comment that I had about observing your work, reading your books and observing your um, talks, lectures. I came away with a phrase that I could pretty, you know, out of crafting this phrase to describe your work. And the, the phrase that I came up with is that you, your work is a searching syncretism of inspiration. <laughs> it reminded me of what uh, the Jewish rabbi and philosopher Maimonides once said. He said, accept the truth from whoever utters it. Um, and so can great literature transcend the varieties of human differences and advantage? Can in, in our modern age, can we see literature as a conversation that takes us, even though the, the books may be conversing amongst each other, can we plug ourselves into that conversation? Yeah, I think we can. You know, C.S. Lewis is very popular for having reportedly said, we read to know that we are not alone, right? Very dramatic, very beautiful statement comes in the movie Shadowlands. You know, I never liked that that definition. I think, I think no, there's something wrong if we are reading for confirmation. I mean, there may be times when we need that, when we don't wanna be a lone man in the wilderness thinking our solitary thoughts. But, but I think something very opposite to that is the case. I think we, we, we should read to realize how conditioned we are by our own culture, uh, by our own experiences and, and environment. I think we read to be exposed to something new and fresh that resonates with us in, in a powerful way. Um, it doesn't have to be a different culture or ethnicity or, or gender, but it can be. It can be a contemporary. But no, I think we read to be exposed to the varieties of uh, expressions of truth that... Uh, that have been expressed by, by the greatest, most thoughtful minds in our in our culture and, and that's, that's, that's very original. Reminds me of what you said last year in your lecture that you know if you ever find yourself wandering or roaming or just kind of lost in your purpose of life, the one thing you should do is find a poet to to give you some inspiration or guidance. Yeah, do through the mundane. Yeah, yeah. Recommend any. The listeners. Yeah, yeah. Um, I have two or three poets that I turn to in particular when I feel that I just want some kind of spiritual nourishment and solidarity. Uh, first and favorite would be George Herbert. Uh, wrote a collection called The Temple, uh, but but read his The Pulley, um, one of his most magnificent expressions. Another favorite uh, of Herbert's for me is is prayer. And what I love about his poem, Prayer, is not its religious content, but, but it's that in this poem, he exemplifies in its most condensed form what great poetry does, right? His, po his, prayer, his poem on prayer is just a 14-line series of metaphors. For example, he, he starts by saying prayer, the church's banquet, angel's age, God's breath in man returning to his birth, the soul in paraphrase, the heart in pilgrimage, reversed thunder. And at that point, I'm already blown away because I'm thinking every single one of those metaphors gives me this completely new way to think about prayer. 
reverse it thunder. What an image, the soul in paraphrase. So he's a poem, a poet that I read both for his devotional uh, intensity, but also just for the magnificence of his of the freshness of perspectives he he, he brings to the table. And then Gerard Manley Hopkins would probably be my second choice. He's a Victorian poet who, rather like Jane Austen, but in a different way, is simply expanding our conception of what the English language is capable of doing. And he just stuns and surprises us by, by his dexterity with the language, but it's always filled with a profound spiritual pathos as well. Well, I want to open this up to our viewers. Um, feel free to ask a question submitted by the Q&A if you have one. Uh, there is a lot to think about and talk about uh, from this discussion. And, you know, as we wait for questions to come in, I, I also remember something you said. This is probably maybe 10 years ago. You said this in some talk that um, you think that the existentialists had it right, that ultimately we are the ones who choose what we want to be, who we want to be, and we are fully accountable for that. And uh, yeah, well, I'm I'm glad you 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 make that comment slash question. Um, so let me share with you what I think is, uh, in my experience, the most profound sentence I've ever read in in a work of literature. So it's by Shelley, and it's in his drama called uh, Prometheus Unbound. And in this work, he is asking the question I referred to earlier. Effectively, he's, he's asking, if we take a universe and, and, and rip out of it any transcendent value, any ultimate good, any God, any stable truth that is enduring, what then? Where, what next? Where do we go? And so in his treatment of this, he depicts the Christ crucified and then shows that in the aftermath of Christianity's birth, the world goes to hell in a handbasket. Nobody believes in the Christ. His work turns out to have been futile. And these tormentors point that out to this heroic figure, Prometheus. And they say, what do you have to say now that we have shown that even the most sublime gesture of human goodness was futile. And Prometheus responds with this line. He says, your words are like a winged snake, and yet I pity those they torture not. And you have to think for a minute. Now, wait, wait, what's, what's just happened here? And at that point, these, these monstrous furies just flee the scene. They, they realize they've been defeated. What, what Prometheus, Prometheus is saying is that even if we all learned that tomorrow morning, the universe is going to blow up and God with it, would that mean that the powers of nihilism triumph? And Shelley's answer is not if I'm here to weep, that that is happening. Because suddenly what has happened is in the midst of this vacuum, a human value, compassion, has reasserted itself into the void. And that can be the foundation of a whole new structure of, of beauty and, and meaning. So that's the kind of existentialism I'm talking about, where we realize that the power is in ourselves to found systems of value and meaning and, and affirmative, uh, beautiful um, feelings and, and emotions that aren't dependent on anything outside of, of themselves. So I don't think that that's, that's uh, I don't think that that depends on whether you're, as I said, a theist or an atheist. There's, there's a power and a beauty and a capacity in human freedom that I think Shelley discovered that is uh, it's magnificent. Do you see echoes of that in the, the Grand Inquisitor chapter of the Brothers Karamazov? Exactly. That's exactly what happens uh -huh. in the Grand Inquisitor. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Good connection. At that moment, Alyosha 
has been convinced by Ivan that there is no God or his plan is not worth embracing. He's admitted defeat. And just on the moment of triumph, as Ivan thinks, right, Ivan the nihilist has won, then Alyosha kisses Ivan. And suddenly this gesture of love flowers out of the void and we have meaning and value again. Yeah. Yeah. And what is that line in, in that chapter about the, we should never, the price of our conscience is never, basically we should never sacrifice our conscience for. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's, or something that's like the that. subsequent chapter. That's, that's the, uh, the, 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 no, that, that's the grand inquisitor chapter uh, after the mutiny chapter. And, and, oh, yeah. and what what Yvonne is saying there is that we man has no greater desire than to entrust his conscience to another. Mm. It's one of those brilliant insights about the, the, the danger and the problems of institutional religion. That if we think the function of religion is to make our moral choices for us, then we have abdicated our, our conscience in, in a horrific way. Do you think literature does represent that? Um, that um, force of freedom within a world that can be kind of mechanized and structured, and it always has to remain free and just kind of un, unadulterated. Well, I, I think that literature itself plays with the, the tension between that, that dream of absolute freedom and unfetteredness mm -hmm. and the recognition that, look, all forms of communication, all forms of human meaning have to take place within languages and vocabularies and circumscribed meaning. And so Wordsworth even writes a wonderful sonnet about this, right? Where he says, nuns fret not at, at the constraints of the convent. Um, writing a sonnet is a pure expression of creative freedom, but it has to take place within 14 lines and an octave and a sestet and follow these rules of meaning. And it has to, you see what I mean? Mm, and so yeah. I think literature is always playing with its tension between this impulse we have to just express ourselves mm -hmm. within systems that are that's true they're going to be true you can say the same about music it yeah. does laws yeah unless you're schoenberg then you can try and rupture those but. well we still have time for questioning but i actually have one more we have not received a question yet but you know one problem we see today is is the over, well, what I would call maybe the over analysis of literature, trying, maybe a reductionism of literature, trying to reduce it down to only uh, the mere expression of an age, the mere expression of a culture or of a race, a gender, or, you know, a person of a particular socioeconomic status. What is it also about the muse that can completely pull someone out of that and speak in a timeless way. Yeah. That both are happening, I think. What, do you think so? that's the case? Well, he, you know, he, here's, here's the, the, the sad fact. You know, I talked about how for most of history, literature was seen as imitation, mimesis, representation. If you ask a typical student today, go to any English class in the country and say, what is art? The student will say, art is expression. Right? That's the paradigm shift of modernity, art is expression. And then I want to say, well, then what's the difference between Shakespeare and a three-year-old that throws a fit in the checkout line? Because that's, that's pure expression. And so I think we have to resist, at least I personally resist, that movement towards, as I said, this kind of self-important art is about my, right, the expression of my whatever, my, my, myself, my, my traumas, my, my, my moment in time. Um, I think the fact that we continue to have a tradition, the fact that Shakespeare continues to draw throngs, that Beethoven concerts continue to pack uh, concert halls, is to my mind at least a pretty good indication, if not proof, that there is something that is greater than self-expression that is drawing us into communion with great art. And I, I think to my mind, the missing kind of factor in contemporary understandings and, and experiences of art is humility. I think it's about humility. We, 
you know, we, 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 we go to an art museum or we go to a play and then we pass judgment on it, not recognizing that actually we're the ones being judged because the great tradition has already proven itself. Shakespeare doesn't have to defend his credentials. Uh, we're being tested. We're, we're being evaluated, I think, in the way that we respond to, to great art. I like that. Well, let me ask a question from Betsy Vandenberg. Um, she's a longtime Books and Bridges um, supporter. She asks, thank you so much for this soul-feeding session. I didn't know I was starving for. How can those of us who read for meaning and not for scoring political or ideological points cultivate and support great ideas, especially in the face of so much going against both? Well, uh, you know, I, I think it's, in, it's some, at one level, the answer is pretty simple and direct. And it's by books, by those whose ideas and modes of expression you want to sustain. Um, you know, the art world uh, and the publishing world are, they're motivated by, by gain, by the profit motive. And, uh, you know, publishers will publish what they think will sell. And so we can complain about the paucity of great literature, about, about how downhill all the trajectories seem, but that's because there haven't been enough of us in the past to, to support and, and sponsor and subsidize those whose works we love. So go out and buy a copy of Mary Oliver's poetry. Go out and buy a book by B uh, Billy Collins or go out and buy a novel by Marilyn Robinson, um, who is a lone star on the horizon of contemporary literature, as far as I'm concerned. So. Oh, great recommendations. I think people have been saying that about literature since probably the Middle Ages, and it's always been on the decline, right? <laughs> Uh, yeah, to some extent, that's that's been true. Although I do think that there's been an educational shift. I think that until the mid 20th century, there was a widespread assumption that you go to school to have your tastes educated. That's, I mean, that's not my assumption. We can see that in educational texts and theory and the philosophy of the Enlightenment you go to have your tastes educated. And if you don't like Shakespeare, that's your deficiency and somebody failed in their, in their education. And, and so, so I, I think that there was a much greater recognition that there was something called great music and great literature, great art through most of Western civilization. It's only in the contemporary age with atomistic individualism that, that we become the center and source of meaning and value. Well, let's conclude with that. Um, that's a great, great point to include on. And this has just been a discussion for me. Lots to think about, lots of great advice to shape my own reading and to shape my own approach to literature. Um, and your enthusiasm as a professor really comes shining out. I think your students were very fortunate to have you. Thank you, Nate. They better, be. hey. they better remember you. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Okay, well, thank you very much. That will conclude our um, discussion and we will see you next time. Thank, thank you. you. Bye. Bye.